This example really sucks to play on guitar. There's no other way to say it. Joe Henderson is one of the three tenor players to really create and shape the sound of modern jazz. And you probably know him mostly from songs like Blue Bossa or Inner Urge or Recorder Mail, but his impact as a composer and certainly also as an improviser goes way beyond that. In this video, I'm going to analyze some phrases from his solo on really a simple piece, namely Take the A Train by Billy Strayhorn, which is in many ways really a beginner standard. But what Joe Henderson does with it goes way, way beyond that. My name is Jens Larsen. If you want to learn jazz and make music, then subscribe to my channel and click the little bell icon so you don't miss anything. When I'm talking about the big three, then I'm of course talking about John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter and Joe Henderson. I think they are the most influential when it comes to both developing improvisation and also composing new music and taking hard bop to the next level. Of course, that's my opinion. I'm kind of curious what you guys think. So if I left somebody out, if some of, one of them shouldn't be in there, then let me know in the comments. This first example, I think, illustrates really well how Joe Henderson works a lot with motifs. And he's quite subtle about it, which is quite refreshing. You don't really hear that he's sort of obviously moving around motifs, but he does work with it really a lot. And in this example, he's kind of doing it on two levels as well. So this is the beginning of the solo. He's coming out at the end of the theme and then playing a pickup, which is really just a flat nine and a seventh on a G7. So, and then resolving that down to C major. And then he takes that whole phrase and repeats it later on the C major. So we get A flat and F and then resolving that again down to G and E. And now the motif kind of becomes just the, the third interval. So we get resolving that to the E and then he goes to the D7 on the B flat. Now, in fact, I don't think he's really playing. You could argue that this was like a, a B flat seven altered. That's possible. But I think it actually sounds more like he's in fact really playing A flat seven here. He's coming out with this phrase, which is A flat major pentatonic, and then he skips up, and to go to the D minor he plays this, and I think that's really starting to sound a lot more like an A flat seven. He later, actually quite quickly, starts changing this to something else as well. But I think it's more of an A flat seven than it's a D D seven here. Of course, it's hard to tell because we don't have anybody playing the chords. We don't even have a bass player. Then we get a D minor line, which is fairly straightforward. So he's... Some chromaticism and the arpeggio. And then ending on the root of the dominant, which he does quite a lot. So just the G. This example, I think, is clearly illustrating two important features in Joe Henderson's playing. One is how he works with rhythm as a way of creating tension and release. And the other one is how he's really often making lines that use pedal points. And in that way, creating the illusion of two voices. And if you check out some of the people that listen to Joe Henderson and check him out for sure, like uh, Michael Brecker or Chris Potter, you will hear them do uh, melodic and use melodic ideas like this pretty much exactly like him. So the first part of this is really sort of the rhythm idea. So he comes out on the 2-5 at the end of the first A. And then in the second A he moves directly into this phrase that's only off beats. It's a very simple C major phrase. So this is all about rhythm. Moving on to what I discussed previously is probably an A flat 7, but now he's already in the second A changing into an A flat minor chord. So we come out on the A flat and then he's using the A flat sort of as a high pedal point and then as a second voice to that he has a descending scale one so down to the ninth. Joe Henderson uses the dominant seven flat five arpeggio quite a lot when he wants to play a diminished sound on a dominant, you'll see that come back in a later example as well. And of course here you also have, well actually you both have the pedal point and the motif idea because you have the, where we have this pedal point of a high G and then the other voice that's just kind of giving away the harmony 
moving on to, uh, below it. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that there is a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting the channel. I'm very grateful for their support. And if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. If you join us over there, I can also give you something in return for your support. This example really sucks to play on guitar. There's no other way to say it. At the same time, it's also really a clear example of something that Joe Henderson does really a lot where he will take sort of these very quick, short runs of 16 notes and use those and often also turn them into some sort of sequence or motif. And that's also what's happening here. It's on the bridge. He's playing on the F major seven and really fairly simple uh, line, really just in the changes. So A and then a quick minor pentatonic run down to the major seven, ending on the, on the D here on the six. And then he repeats that, but changes the rhythm a bit and then takes that down the scale. And then we go to the A minor seven in the second half of the bridge. And then we get first really a clear example of also of something that I think is tied more to modern players that they will use like a large range within quite a short amount of time. That's something that you, you don't see that so much with the bebop guys. So he really plays the low A and then we get a phrase that's essentially A minor pentatonic, and then a scale run on D7, and then on the D minor seven. And then from here, he skips all the way up to the high E, so there's like a 13. And here again, we get the dominant seven flat five arpeggio. So that's the E, D, B flat and A flat, which is a B flat seven uh, flat five. And also, really coming out on that flat nine, which of course connects back to the melody also. If you want to check out a video that I did on one of the other saxophone players of the big three, namely John Coltrane, then check out this video where I'm analyzing his solo on Take the Coltrane. I think it's a great example of a solo that's really going further than bebop. So we're not really just playing melodies that spell out the changes. There's really something else happening. That's about it for this time. Thank you for watching and until next time.